Hello, this is the RPG Pundit, the final boss in internet shitlords. And uh, today I'm going to talk about something I've had a debate the other day on Twitter with someone. Um, a few, Actually, a couple of weeks ago now. But um, it was on the topic of, of magic and magical power levels. And uh, I guess that's going to be kind of the, the topic for today. I'm also going to talk a bit more about the Invisible College. Um, first, though, some some programming notes, I guess. Um, I might do another video before the, the weekend, but if I don't, well, this weekend on Sunday, we have Inappropriate Characters. So check that out on the Inappropriate Characters channel. Me, Venger, and Joe are going to be getting together. Don't know if we have any guest stars or not. We're going to, I guess I'm going to find out. You'd think we'd be, we'd have planned this by now, but maybe, maybe I need to get in touch with them. Um, but we're going to be talking about interesting stuff in the gaming world, to be sure. Including probably some of uh, the recent controversy that uh, Venger has has accrued for himself. And other topics of interest, too. Um, so don't miss that. And then uh, next week, on the 16th, I think it is, I'm going to be showing up on a YouTube channel for the T-Shirted Historian. So um, keep your eyes open there. I'll send the link later through the through uh, well on on my social media and on YouTube for those of you who are subscribed. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this channel. Hit the like button. <laughs> share this video after you've finished watching it if you enjoyed it to anyone who you think will like it or who who will get pissed off by it. And uh, be sure to check out all of my products like Lion and Dragon and the Invisible College, um, as well as my RPG Pundit presents pdf series where you can you know you can support me by buying any of these products but you're also getting something for yourself something that you can use in an actual play and i'm always a big my big deal is always actual play oh yeah and speaking of which before i get to the main topic um in the osr game jam that i've been talking about in the last two videos and i think i'll keep the link in the description below just because of this this new development uh, it's already started producing a large a, a large number of supplements. I think there's like nine last time I checked, maybe ten. I don't remember exactly, but there might be more by the time you watch this. And so the OSR Game Supplement Jam is on itch.io, and it's a an event where we've gotten like about eighty. I think I, we might be above eighty now. I don't know eighty people, and I say we, but I have nothing much to do with it other than promoting it. You know, it's really all Taylor Lane. It's all thanks to them. Um, and anyways, the Taylor Lane has gone together like about 80 people who are all going to be writing supplements for existing OSR RPGs. It's the OSR Supplement Jam. And so, for example, I've authorized it. If anyone wants to, and you can still do this, if, even if you're, you aren't on yet, you can join. And it's, it's until the end of the month that you have to make a supplement. It could be a short supplement, long supplement. So if you, you know, if you want to do a supplement for Lion and Dragon or the Invisible College, that would be awesome, right? Get on there and make a supplement. You can publish it. Um, people will, you know, more people will, will buy it or download it or whatever because they, you know, because it's a game product that they already know. But it'll also give you, uh, aside from whatever money you decide to sell it for, uh, it'll it'll give you uh, more um uh, more opportunity to get known, right? So it's a, it's a great deal. And one of the products that has already come out is a supplement of uh, for Star Adventurer of Mecha Rules. <laughs> I think that's just great. You know, I took a look at it. It looks pretty good. It's, uh, it's not a huge supplement, but it's got all that you need, I think, to, to incorporate into the, the um, kind of rules of Star Adventurer the uh existence of giant robots you know? so uh and you know power armor suits and things like that so so be sure to check that out if you're a fan of star adventure get over there get to the game jam check the 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 created products already and you're gonna find it there no problem so uh and be sure you know i think he said it at pay what you want but uh be sure to give the guy a tip so you know it's encouraging him to make more products right um anyways that's what's great about all this so on to the main topic. Um, I had this debate with some guy a while back who who uh, was really insisting that uh, making a campaign where players don't get access to high-powered magic, you know, magical spells and magical items, 
is somehow inferior to the default. And I, and this wasn't a 5e guy either. There's like some groanyard for, for the, I think it was some part of the bro SR, right? And it turns out that the bro SR are kind of pussies, I guess, because they're, uh, the, apparently they need a lot of magic items to have fun. You know, they, they want to have a, they want to play a Monty Hall campaign or something. But anyway, this guy, he, uh, he was insisting that you, uh, you know, that, that a, a game where characters are filled with magic items is going to be more fun than when, than when they're not. And I don't know what you think about that, but I think that's complete bullshit. I mean, frankly, um, one, of the, one of the reasons he was saying this was an attack on my Lion and Dragon game. In Lion and Dragon, you're playing a medieval authentic game. Now, this is, means that it's inspired by authentic medieval myth, legend, and history, and folklore. And in all of those, including history, by the way, there were magic items. <laughs> but uh, in all of those, including history, the magic items were exceedingly rare. You know, it was there was usually a guy that had one special thing, you know. Um, the, the great swords, for example, uh, you know, like Cortana, you know, um, I'll show you there. I've got them here, right? <laughs> if you take a look, uh, this is this is my magic item section coming up right now. There you go. And in the magic item, you get uh, there's a list of magic items, all of which are based on actual um, things from medieval authentic history, um, and these. Uh, these things like the the three great swords, right? Cortain, Joyeuse, and Durandal. There was one of each, and they were made by Wayland the Smith. And there's a whole story to them, right? And um, they they each have the part that they played, you know. Um, so um, so Charlemagne had uh, had Joyeuse. Durandal was the great knight. Roland um, Cortain belonged to. Uh, to Ogier, um, and then, um, anyways, the, 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 the point is, these are items that have, they, they are swords with names, they are weapons that have incredible power. In the game, they're holy swords in the hands of human, they grab, grant plus one to hit or damage. Now, in the hands of a lawful fighter, or a uh, lawful cleric or fighter of at least fifth level, uh, with a social status of knight or higher, they do plus three to hit or damage. Also, if the wielder is a faithful follower of the unconquered sun, they will do plus five to hit against chaos creatures including all demons and the undead, uh, and do you the double the usual damage against the same. Um, for Unconquered Sun, you can read Jesus if you prefer, right? <laughs> Whatever it is. Um, but the point is that these, uh, this is this is like, these are the most powerful swords in the world in Lion and Dragon, right? Um, but you don't need to have super duper powerful swords if the mere fact of having a magic item is a, is a special and unique experience. So, uh, there's magic in Lion and Dragon. You can play a magister. He can make magic. <laughs> magic is not the firing of fireballs. It's not the making of, um, you know, uh, these these wondrous effects that you see in D and D. Well, in every D and D edition, uh, each one perhaps more so than the last. Um, but instead, it is you know ritual magic that has. That can sometimes do very powerful and effective things, but you have to be a trained magician. You have to spend a lot of time getting to there. I mean, like alchemy. If you got alchemy, you can make dragon fire, the elixir of life. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff, but it takes a really long time and a lot of money and so patronage and then role playing elements for you to be able to make these incredible magic things. Um, and and I think that's way better, right? In a world where you have a complete um glut of magic items magic items are meaningless the more magic there is in a, this is this is a pundit rule here folks the more magic that you have in a setting the less special magic is it's obvious it's an obvious rule right if you want a, a setting where magic is something special then it has to be a setting where by default in the setting Magic very rarely is, right? There's, there, there, you can't just walk around to any little village and go into the magic shop and buy a magic sword. If you're doing that, magic isn't special at all. It's no more special than a sword, which you can go into any village and buy. You've reduced magic to a level of the absolute mundane. Um, and then, you know, a plus one sword is worthless. It's something that everybody in a village could buy. Uh, if you're, If, on the other hand... 
you have a world where, you know, swords, magical swords are these precious inheritances handed down, usually only in noble families, right? But, you know, maybe once in a while there are exceptions um, that, that have like this incredible history, this name, they were wielded by the greatest people that ever lived and things like that, right? <laughs> um, then that sword, even if all it does is like it does damage to supernatural creatures, even if it has no bonus to hit, that would still make it amazing, right? That would still make it a great sword uh, and it would make it a great magic item, an object of great power, right? If you have like um, some holy relic that, you've, that, that has been handed down in your family, right? Some piece of a saint and it has the power to heal the pox, right? Or something. That is an incredible, devastating magic item in a world where, where people, you know, uh, are dying of the pox routinely and you don't have, um, you might have clerics that can heal that with miracles, right? Which you do in Lion and Dragon, but you don't have um, a, a healing potion uh, or a scrolls of cure disease available ad, ad infinitum, you know? Um, so it, it seems obvious to me. And in terms of the power level of magicians, if, uh, if there's a world where very, very few characters reach a high level of magic, if you're playing a magician who reaches a high level of power and he's able to produce these items, he'll be a person of, of global renown, right? And he'll be able to name his price. And this is, this is a part of, of what will happen in a typical sort of Lion and Dragon campaign. In the Invisible College, um, I'm currently running an Invisible College campaign and you have um, a, a necessity... Part of the necessity of this game, because this is a modern game set in the modern, you know, presumably 2022 in the modern world, and you are playing a secret order of magicians, and the magic is based on real world magic. And, and of course, um, that means that you can't, this is not Shadowrun or something like that. It's not a magic where you're going to have um, typical Wizards of the Invisible College flinging around fireballs or something like that. Um, the magic has to reflect the paradigm of the world. Otherwise, what you've done is you've created an alternative fantasy earth, but that's not what Invisible College is meant to be. It's meant to be um, a, a plausible version of our real world um, with elements of magic, right? So to do that, you can't have spell slinging wizards running around on the street making spells that are, that are plainly evident. And, uh, and in, in the Invisible College, you at the same time, you know, the real world magic has certain things that are that are very remarkable and that that are um, high level abilities, you could say. So what I did with the Invisible College and, and thankfully the, the, the structure of how real occultism works in the modern in the modern context provided for this, I create a kind of a before and after um, that happens with the steps of, of attainment in in a magician's path now in um in the path of the wizard you, you you see in the last video i did on this topic which i think was sometime well it was this year but i don't remember if it was in late january or early february because since then i've done some other videos that got in the way of me talking more about the invisible college um i i talked about the path of attainment and you can check back and find that video it's something about um well, it's it's on the topic of magic, obviously. <laughs> um, so so you can find that video, and you'll you'll understand about how like player character magicians in the Invisible College have an attribute called attainment. As it goes up in level, they they reach certain barriers that they have to to achieve certain uh, achievements in magic to be able to get more attainment after that. And as you gain attainment, you gain way more magical power, right? So in in a typical Invisible College game. At the very beginning of the campaign, characters are going to be able to do very little with magic. They're, they're going to have a few magical practices and a few magical theories. You know, by, by a few, I mean possibly just like one of each if they're a magician or a couple of each. Um, but most of what they're going to do is not, is not really going to be useful to them in, in action, so to say, right? Especially at the low levels. And so they're going to be, uh, have to rely on other abilities and resources besides magic to get stuff done. And then as they go along, they're making the way along the path of attainment. They start to learn a lot more of these magical theories and magical practices. They, they now have different ways that they can combine all of those together to, um, to make different types of spell effects. And they can start doing some more interesting stuff. One of the things in the campaign that, that typically becomes available relatively early is uh, forms of divination magic that allows them to help in investigative procedures. And then 
Uh, beyond that, you start learning invocation and evocation. So you can invoke divine archetypes to give yourself bonuses, or you can evoke um, demonic forces and bind them to achieve specific results. And that's some of the most powerful low-level magic that you can get, where you can obtain bonuses or have weird magical effects happen by by binding demonic beings. Um but of course, there's a risk because if you fail to effectively control the being, then there can be some serious consequences, right? Um, so at, at the mid-level, you get to a bottleneck. And that bottleneck is um, the requirement of becoming what's called an adept, a middle-level uh, magician, which sounds middle, but it's actually an incredibly powerful magician because hardly anyone becomes an adept, right? Uh, and the way to become an adept in the context of the Invisible College is through the Abramaline ritual. This is based on a grimoire called the Book of the Sacred Magic of Abramaline. And it, it has a ritual that requires at least six months to perform, where for at least um, certainly the last two and probably really the last four, you have to separate yourself almost completely from worldly affairs. And so it becomes very difficult to engage in any other activity besides the performance of this ritual. And it must be performed to completion or there are, there are extreme um, penalties, you could say. You, you, it had, there are extreme consequences to one's own sanity and to the place where you've done it and all kinds of stuff if you fail to complete the ritual. And so right away, this shows you that there's a, suddenly this big stepping stone for a player character and we're about to hit this stepping stone in my current Invisible College campaign, where there is at least one character who's almost ready to perform the Abermillion ritual. And when he begins to do that, um, basically, he's going to, maybe for the first couple of months in game time, he'll be able to do certain things. But he, but he won't be able to do everything because he's still got to dedicate at least a couple of hours a day to this practice. And he must do it. If you, if you fail, if you break even once then uh, there are some very, very serious consequences to your mental sanity and to, to um, you know, um, and supernatural consequences. So after that, for certainly the next four months after that, the character will pretty much be out of the action and the player will have to make another character or take, you know, a break. <laughs> or the DM has to speed up past that time. Um, but, uh, you know, the way I'm running my current campaign, that's not going to happen. So <laughs> that character is going to have to take a pause. The player will make another character. Now, some people might run a campaign where the DM will say, okay, well, then in that case, four months go by, what's everyone else doing? And then we're going to continue after that. So they can make it a little bit easier. Um, but if I was the DM, I'd make sure that at least there was some um, some elements of expressing how, how difficult this is. Because essentially at the peak of the Abermaline ritual, you are isolated in a place in, in a temple in space where you can do nothing else but engage in this ritual, um, you know, and, and the most basic elements of taking care of yourself and nothing else. Um, if you fail at the ritual, you can end up having all kinds of terrible misfortunes happen um, to to yourself and to the people around you, and also, of course, to your mental well being. As I mentioned before in this game there are sanity mechanics, right? Not, not, like, not exactly like the Call of Cthulhu ones, but where you can end up having alterations to how your character behaves through the, an ongoing process of mental trauma in, in three particular areas that affect wizards, which is uh, uh, paranoia, megalomania, and, uh, and detachment. Um, anyways, so bad things happen to you if you stop. But when, if you get all the way to the end... Then there is a three-day ceremony where you perform an invocation plus Abermaline check um, to summon forth the Algoides, the, the holy guardian angel, the, uh, the archetype of your own higher self. Um, and if you succeed, uh, then you, you attain a, a life-altering experience of your higher self manifested, um, which will unlock all kinds of abilities that you never had before. Um, if you fail on any result other than a natural one, you can continue to repeat the ritual uh, for another two months, and you can continue to do, doing that um, every time. So in theory, you could end up doing it for a year and a half or two years or whatever before you actually succeed uh, and just keep going. But if you stop 
Or if you get a natural one, it means the ritual has failed and you get all the bad consequences for it. Um, if you succeed, then immediately your higher self, your holy guardian angel, which appears at this moment because your consciousness is not fully, um, it's not at, at the full state of uh, attainment, um, you aren't fully illuminated, it'll appear to you as a separate being from you that will act as, a, as, a, um, as an advisor. Um, it will immediately train you in several techniques of magic that you didn't have yet. Um, it'll also teach you how to con connect to it and, and communicate with it for the purpose of obtaining more information and training. And then, after all that, you have to um, perform a ritual to evoke and bind the four kings of hell. Because when you go to the higher world, after that, you have to go down to the underworld and use that authority granted to you by the Supreme Being to now bind the, the forces of the underworld, right? And... and um, put them under the authority of that divine uh, of that divine force that you are now acting in the name of. So you go down, you, you evoke the four kings of hell, and in that way you end up having control um, over the, um, the shadow world, the, under, the underworld, that which is below, and you have the, uh, the approbation of that which is above. Once you do this, you can use those evoked forces to create a series of magical squares. And those magical squares are incredibly high powered magic, right? You use them and they just work and <laughs> they can do incredible, incredible things. Does it sound like I'm speaking for first hand? <laughs> Maybe I am. <laughs> but uh, anyway, these, these um, magical squares provide you with suddenly a crap ton of potential powers. If you take the time to make them, and uh, it'll, it, it changes the entire power level. Also, the fact that you've become an adept changes the entire power level of the game because adepts now ha can have much higher attainment level and they can, um, they can end up, um, for example, performing magical checks to, to enter into states of higher clarity um, they can access the Holy Guardian Angel by doing an attainment check um, and uh, receive insights. And they can carry on to the highest level, which is to become a master of the temple. But that's kind of the end game. You know, to become fully illuminated is the end game of the Invisible College RPG. Um, which, which is to say, you know, as you keep going, you're basically transforming into, you know, an avatar or a Buddha or however you want to put it. And so you're now able to do uh, these these incredible things. Now, in, in none of these will it usually look like you're flinging around fireballs, right? But I think it'll be pretty clear that, you've, that you're able to accomplish um, wondrous and miraculous powers that, that become very, very high-level powers so that in the higher-level Invisible College campaign, you're not really going around on the street having street-level adventures fighting enemy agents. You could be time traveling or uh, going into other dimensions, interacting with gods and demons and, uh, uh, you know, determining the fate of the world, stuff like that. <laughs> you know? So, uh, so I think, you know, it's not to say therefore that I, that I don't like high level magic, but I think that if you just throw around high level magic for no good reason, then um, you're cheapening your game. Right. And, and, and you're make, you're cheapening the magic. The value of magic is useless if everybody has it. Now, if really high powered magicians like adepts and, and, and masters in the invisible college are extremely rare, then encountering them is a huge event. Right. And becoming one of them is the ultimate goal. If, if magic, if high level magic is rare, then having it is an enormous value, an enormous advantage. If magic is everywhere and everyone has it, then having them is just an equipment requirement, which is stupid, right? And, and so if you, um, if you make these things rare, they end up becoming worthwhile and also central and thematic to your campaign. I guess that's everything for now. I've already said to subscribe and share the video and to buy my stuff. So I'll, I'll leave it at that with uh, currently smoking a Dunhill Shell Diplomat plus Argento Natural.